before we uh, begin worshiping the Lord, just a reminder that there is no one greater than Him. Nothing happens without His say. Nothing uh, can thwart His sovereign plan or hand from working. And we celebrate that. We rejoice in that. That gives us hope. That gives us a reason to celebrate. A couple things coming up uh, in the next week or two. Guess who's coming to dinner? Uh, it, today is the last day to sign up. So if you have not done that yet, there's a, a sign-up sheet right here on the information table. We are in need of a few more people who would be willing to host a group. And so if you're like, hey, I can, I can uh, open up my house, provide some meat and, and drinks, sweet, awesome, thank you. Make sure you sign up on that sheet um, or, or let me know so that we can get you to the right people. Uh, starting next Sunday, the kids up to, I believe, fifth grade are going to go right when the sermon starts. They're going to go out into the children's church room and they're going to start practicing for the Christmas program. That will be December, I think it's 15th. Um, and so if you have kiddos, Probably not like newborn, newborn, but uh, nursery through fifth grade, they'll be able to go there. If they're in the nursery during the service, just make sure you sign them up in the nursery. Uh, I think there's a little sheet in there as well, just to make sure they get taken across the hallway to practice for those Christmas songs. It's always a fun time to, to watch the little kids sing up here uh, and worship the Lord in their own special way. Uh, OCC is nearing its end. Uh, so we'll commission all the all the shoe boxes on the 17th. So you have two more weeks from today to get those done. Um, we're about halfway uh, for what we normally have. Um, and so I just encourage you, if you're like, oh, dang it, I keep forgetting about it. You got two more Sundays to get that done um, before we commission on the 17th. So make sure you see Marsha. If you're like, hey, I really want to pack a shoe box myself, just check with her and, and schedule a time and you can go upstairs um, and, and get that all, all packed up, okay? Um, so, obviously this week, big week. Lots of, uh, I'm excited for Wednesday, um, because then my TV goes back to normal. But in the meantime, make sure, uh, get out to vote on Tuesday. Just a couple things from, from leadership. Uh, as you look at Scripture, Paul tells us, Romans chapter 13, to honor the ruling authorities, uh, sub, subject yourselves to your rulers because all authority, all rule comes from the one who rules over everything is God himself. He's the one who institutes it. He's the one who sets up and establishes kings. He's the one who tears down and destroys nations. God's the one who is in control. Um, but also, as you look at Scripture, God has continually told his people to seek the welfare of the place where you are where God has placed you. He tells that to, to Israel as he sends them off into Babylon. He says, hey, marry off your daughters. Build houses. Seek the welfare. Uh, eat the produce. Uh, seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you. You're going to be here a while. And so for us as believers, this is not our home. This is just a place that we are passing through until Jesus comes back. We just happen to be Christians who live in America, and we, make sure, we need to make sure we keep our priorities straight and in the right order. Um, but with that, we have to recognize we are still instruments in God's hands, and God chooses to use his people to move the world to push his plans and purposes. And so ultimately, while we are broken and fallen, God is not. And so as Christians, it is our joy to celebrate our God, to remind ourselves that this world is not our home, and God will set up his eternal dominion, his eternal kingdom when he comes back. But in the meantime, we are to use whatever powers and rights and privileges that we have to continue to push for our God to be made much of, and for His will to be done. And so we can, as we go to the polls on Tuesday, keep in mind that whatever comes through on Wednesday morning or late Tuesday night, 
our God is still sitting on the throne. Our God is still the same God today as he will be on Wednesday and Thursday and in 10 years and in 20 years. And we can know that God works out all things for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. And so I just want to encourage you to vote. I want to encourage you to, more than even that, though, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Don't let the wind and the waves distract you. Don't let it cause up doubt in your hearts. Believe and trust that God is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he will do. Will you stand up with me as we pray together and get ready to worship the Lord in singing? Heavenly Father, it's good to see you on a rainy morning. Uh, Kids, you're dismissed to Children's Church. And I want to start this morning by asking you a question. It's pretty simple. Excuse me. What's your favorite food smell? Think about that for a minute. I'm not trying to make you hungry before lunch, but what's your favorite food smell? For me, it's Joe's baking bread. If I walk in the house and she's baking bread, she could ask for anything. (laughs) Not only that, but smelling it's one thing, but eating it is even better. Um, But the problem is, is after a couple hours, I'm hungry again. I just am. And as I think about that, whether it's eating my favorite food or cheering a sports team, going on a vacation, uh, those things have all got a limited shelf life. They don't last long. They aren't eternal. So if you want something that lasts eternally, we've got to really seek the individual who is eternal. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, So let's pray, and then we'll jump into today's passage. Father, as we've just praised you and sang about you, we know you're an awesome God, but um, in our human spirits and minds, we don't even fully appreciate or know how awesome you are. We know that someday when we do see you, our knees will bow and we'll greatly praise you. But we also know that you love us tremendously. You love us faithfully and thoroughly. And not only did you send your son to proclaim that and to show that and demonstrate that, but then you were kind enough to send your spirit and give us your word. So Father, we just pray that you take the distractions in our minds and our hearts away from us right now and just speak to us through your word. And we'd ask that in your son's name. Amen. Um, a little context. I know, I know you've, uh, you've heard a lot of this already, but real quickly, John 6, a lot of people over the last year have been healed in the area around Capernaum. <clears throat> and it's Passover time. Big crowds, feeding to the 5,000, which obviously was probably more than 15,000. People are convinced that this is the Messiah. They want to make him king forcefully. Jesus doesn't want that. And he dismisses them and then he takes and goes off into the hills. The disciples leave by boat. They go back to Capernaum on the way back. They hit the big storm, experience three more miracles. And the next morning, these 15,000 folks are joined by people that have come across from Tiberias, across the lake. They're all hungry. Basically, they want Jesus to provide them with their morning breakfast burrito. Um, They're looking for food. But Jesus isn't there. 
And so some of them take off and go back to Capernaum. And that's where they find him, at the local synagogue. And so that's where we're going to pick up on today's verses. Now, just a sidebar issue that kind of came to mind as, as I was reading through this. Jesus teaches in a different way here than he does in other, other times and places. Um, sometimes Jesus teaches through prayer. Sometimes he teaches through parables. Sometimes he teaches by asking rhetorical questions. And sometimes he just teaches straight out by saying, this is the way it is. Now, the interesting thing about this last way, and that's the way he's teaching today, is it seems to get more intense the harder the individual's heart is. Think about how he addresses the Pharisees. Now, these people aren't Pharisees. We'll get into that today. But the teaching is more direct. There aren't any questions here. So understand that as we read through this passage, that that's what's, what's happening here, okay? So if you join with me here, John 6, 25 through verses 36. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I assure you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has sent his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform these works of God, they ask? Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. What sign then are you going to do so we may see and believe you, they ask. What are you going to perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. So let's try to unpack these verses, starting with 25 here. When it says, When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? How many of you have ever had somebody ask you a veiled question? You know, they're trying to describe or disguise what they, what they really mean. That's what these folks are doing. They're saying, when did you get here? What they're really thinking is, why did you leave us? Where's the food? Because these folks aren't really followers of Jesus. They're fans. And they have a what have you done for me lately attitude. That's what fans do. They're not concerned about the relationship with Jesus. It's all about what they need and basically what he can do for them. But Jesus knows these folks are fans. It's no surprise to him. Look at his response in verse 26. Jesus answered, I assure you, you were looking for me not because you saw the signs, because you ate the loaves and were filled. It's kind of interesting. Jesus could have answered the question directly they asked. Okay? He could have just said, hey, I walked across the water and got back here to Capernaum. But he doesn't go there. I mean, if he would have gone there, they would have gone, man, this dude is our king. Not only can he feed us, but he can float our boats and walk across the water we can go ahead and we can just destroy the Romans. But he stays away from that. He knows they just want more free food. They're really, they're focused on the product. The product of the miracle. They're not thinking at all about the person of the miracle. And unfortunately, whether we want to admit it or not, we're the same way. Uh, 
we focus on what we think Jesus should do for us, for our needs, our situations, and unfortunately, even our expectations. But Jesus still loves these imperfect fans, uh, and he redirects their focus from their stomachs to their eternity. Go on to verse uh, 27. Look what he says. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. Look how Jesus describes the food here. It's eternal, it's a gift, and it's approved by God. But they miss the point, just like we do. They focus on the word work. We do this all the time. And we ask the same questions that the fan ask, fans ask in verse 28. Look what they say. What can we do to perform the works of God? Tell us what we can do, right? Now, that's an important question. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish that. It is an important question because you want to find out what you can do, but it's more important to understand Jesus' answer and what he says here because it defines their eternity and it defines their spiritual satisfaction. And it really defines on who Jesus really is. But these fans think they can work to obtain God's favor. That's the bottom line here. They're legalists. Now, you got you to gotta cut them some slack here, okay? They only know the law. That's all they've known their whole life, okay? But they should start to recognize the graces God, that Jesus is extending here. They don't. But you have to remember something here, that all legalists want to know what they can do, okay? They want to be able to make rules or laws rather than build relationships. They want to focus on a program or a product over a person. That's another characteristic. And the reason they do that is because they want to be in control, just like us. See, when you get to do a job assignment and it has to do with something spiritual, that gives you some sovereignty over your own spiritual condition. Your salvation becomes a contract. And if you feel that way, or if I feel that way, then I've got some control over it, and I get to help. So this crowd wanted a list of things they could do. Rather than receive what Jesus had already done or what he was going to do. Um, Jesus wanted a relationship with him. And he wants that relationship with us. And to start that relationship, you've got to recognize that making laws or rules does nothing to change our heart. Nothing at all. Um, heart change requires confession. It requires humbling your heart before the Lord. And it requires cultivating a relationship with Jesus. Jesus has got a great reply to their question, though, in 29. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. <laughs> okay, guys, you insist on working? Here's your job description. Believe in the one who he's sent. In other words, your work, your labor, your efforts, it's faith. Stop working and trust me. That's what he's saying. Jesus flips the script on them. Remember their fans. They're working to find him because he's useful to them. He's going to fill their stomachs. But Jesus redirects the focus of their labor. So you want to labor for bread? Have faith in me. Now 
Now, this kind of concerned me when I read this because that can sound really simplistic. And if we're distressed or we've got trials or turmoil or concerns in our life, this really sounds simplistic and impersonal. Your life's going to be all right if you just have faith in Jesus. Now, that's easier if you're in a non-negotiable situation. If you have a death in your family or you have a terminal illness, you have no choice. Yeah, it's easy for me to have faith in Jesus then. But what if it's only a smaller problem? See, we want to go ahead and insert ourselves into those situations. We think we can negotiate with God and help Him solve the issue. And that's when our faith is weakened. When you've got trials in your life, exercising your faith can be scary, it can be counterintuitive. But think about this. Jesus allows us the experience, to experience trials so we can see the reality of our faith and to see the relationship with him. Think about that. Jesus allows us to experience trials so we can see the reality of our faith and our relationship with him. And remember, too, what Jesus promises. If you place your faith in him, he says he's going to lighten your load and your burden, regardless of the situation. Matthew 13, 10. For my yoke is easy and my load is light. So let's go into verse 30. Jesus makes the fans accountable here. And since they don't like accountability, they do what any self-respecting fan is going to do. They shift the issue away from themselves, from themselves and back towards Jesus. Look what they do. What sign then are you going to do so we may see and believe in you? They ask. What are you going to perform? I mean, think about it. Remember, they just watched him over the last year heal many, 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 many people in the area around Capernaum. And just 24 hours before, they watched him feed 15,000 plus folks. And now they've got the nerve to ask him again, what are you going to do so we believe you? In Yiddish, that's called chutzpah. They've got a lot of nerve. Now I'm saying that, but I have to admit that I forget what the Lord has done. I mean, he met my needs yesterday. But when I look at my heart, I want to know what he's going to do that's kind of cool today. And along with that, I forget to thank him a lot of times. Not only for me, but for my family, and even for you out there that I prayed for before. I like this slide here. This is from Paul Tripp, but I really think Paul hits it on a nail on the head here. Humans are hardwired for awe. Our hearts are always captured by something. That's how God made us. But sin threatens to distract us from the glory of our Creator. All too often, we stand in awe of everything but God. We're all hardwired for awe. We like pep rallies, we like sensationalism, we like new stuff, we like new experiences. Ask yourself the question and you'll answer, yeah, I like new things. I like things that are different. Unfortunately, or I don't know how else to say it, there are churches that knowingly and unknowingly use sensationalism or experiences just to tickle the ears of their congregations. It's kind of the adage of, if we keep them wowed, we'll keep them around. And we've got to be vigilant and remember that we are like these fans. We can be drawn into these experiences. There's a discerning wisdom among churches and ministries that apply an old adage of, 
What you win them with is what you win them to. That not only applies there, but parents, that applies to your children. Guys, if you're witnessing to somebody, it applies to the people you're witnessing to. It's even part of your own testimony. What you win them with is what you win them to. So that means you need to be discerning. You need to have the mind of Christ. And the way you're going to have that is to be in his word. So Jesus wasn't about to wow these fans with any more miracles or experiences. But the fans wanted more experiences. They wanted to see the show. And it's Passover time, so they've got a Passover mentality. Look what they say. They challenged Jesus in verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. Just as it is written, he gave them bread to eat, from heaven to eat. <clears throat> Effectively, what they're saying is, okay, Jesus, Moses fed at least three million of us for 40 years. You've given us bread once. The bread came, that Moses fed came from heaven. You just use earthly bread. Basically, they're asking for an encore. Show us what you can do now. The fans' hearts haven't changed. They've got a growling stomach, and what it's really doing is blinding their growling spirit. And we get blinded as well. <clears throat> we need to be aware that current life situations can distract us from what God's Spirit may be trying to do in our lives. Have you ever thought about that? There may be something going on in your life and God's really trying to get your attention. I want to elaborate on this a little bit. In a church body of this size, there's people that are experiencing trials or troubles, um, pain, frustration. There are other people here who are really joyous today, really happy and, you know, having a great life. But there's other people that are really hurting here. But regardless of your situation, God pursues our hearts to draw us close to Him. He did this with the Israelites. He did it with King David. And as you read through John or any of the Gospels, He does that with all of His disciples. God's going to pursue us in unexpected ways, at unexpected times, and he's going to reveal our illusions of self-control. Because we're sinful, we all like to be in control. So we've got to be objective and we've got to ask, is my pride blinding me from a sanctifying event that God's giving me? That's a hard question, because pride gets in our way of us being objective about our relationship with Jesus. Jesus creates sanctifying events to push us into relationships with him. And when we ignore those, we ignore those to our own detriment. So let's go on to 32 here. Jesus is pushing back again. Jesus said to them, I assure you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the real bread from heaven. <clears throat> God's the giver of the manna, not Moses. And it's the father who sent the true bread from heaven. Manna temporarily fills the Israelites' growing stomachs. You can't deny that. But it's the bread of God that's going to permanently fill their souls. And Jesus goes on after he says that, and he names who the true bread is here. Verse 33, for the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Now, depending on your translation, the words the one or he or that which comes down may show up, and it's key to understanding this metaphor because Jesus is not speaking of himself as physical bread, as some churches teach. It's a metaphor. And metaphors aren't unusual for Jesus to use. I mean, think about it. He calls himself the light, the good shepherd, the vine, the gate, the way, the truth, the door. 
So when he says bread, it's just another way he's describing himself. But being the fans they are, they only want to hear about the new stuff. That's what they want. Because look at their uh, response in verse 34. Then they said, sir, give us this bread always. You know, it's, it's the new thing. I want that now. And this isn't the first time that's been said. Does this sound familiar? Remember back when Brandon taught John 4.15, the woman at the well? The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I don't have to get thirsty and keep coming here to draw water. Same mentality. It's the same request the fans made. Because we all have a hard time discerning material wants from spiritual needs. Just like the fans, just like the woman at the well, we're no different. But in verse 35, we come to the main point that Jesus wants to make. It's so important. He's repeating this again in verses 48 and 51, if you read on. He says, I am the bread of life. Jesus told them, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. This is the first of the seven times that Jesus describes himself, starting with the words, I am. <clears throat> Suddenly, Jesus has made himself the only thing on the menu. And the fans have to decide if they want to eat at his restaurant. Because his claim forces them, as it forces us, to consider three things about our relationship with Jesus. The first is, Jesus came into the world not to give bread, but to be bread. Just like the Jewish fans we read about, Jesus came into our world to change our desire so that he becomes our main desire. And it's incumbent on us to ask, does our desire for material needs affect our relationship with Jesus or does our relationship with Jesus affect our material needs? Secondly, Jesus came into our life to ch- or came to change our life and our desires. Now, does Jesus care about you physically? Does he care about what you eat? Does he care about your body? Of course he does. We're not, we're not denying that. But remember, it's your natural temporary body and the food that you eat That's not his primary concern. Those issues all get resolved on the other side of the grave. There's going to be a resurrection someday. And as a believer in Christ, he's going to make your body new and perfect, and you're not going to worry about food. But Jesus didn't come into the world to help you satisfy the desires you have right now not before you were born again. He came to change those desires and to be in control of your life. Thirdly, Jesus did not come to be useful to you. That may be a shock. He came to do the will of the Father. Look what Jesus says in verse 27. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. You cannot forget that Jesus is the second member of the Trinity is approved by God and he perfectly represents God here on earth. Think about these verses. All these verses were being lovingly instructed by the God who spoke everything into creation and holds everything in existence together by his word. That's significant. The reason I bring this up is because I like Tim Keller's comment about this. I think it's really important. And it goes right along with these three statements we've just made. If your God never disagrees with you, 
You might just be worshiping an idealized version of yourself. In other words, if you disagree with what Jesus is saying about himself or about you, he's not the one that has the problem. And in verse 36, Jesus confirms the fan's problem. And it's important because he repeats, repeats this again in verse 64. But as I told you, you've seen me, and yet you do not believe. That's really sad. Jesus has offered himself. He's offered himself as the bread that's going to satisfy their eternal hungry, hunger. And he justifies himself by saying, look, you've seen my miracles. You've seen my actions. You've heard my words. But sadly, they don't believe. They're slaves to their worldly desires. Their non-belief has corrupted their minds. Their non-belief effectively leads them to rationalizing rebellious thoughts, actions, behaviors, and as you even read here, demands. And it's a classic example of what happens when you read about it in Romans 1 when God gives you over. And it's what we see in today's culture as well. Things really haven't changed. So I want to give you a little context before we read on the second set of verses here. We're not going to cover those in the same detail. But Jesus continues to speak to the Jewish fans. Tells them that if they believe him, they're going to be eternally secure. He confirms that he's come to do the will of God the Father. Those that behold and believe will be resurrected and live eternally. The fans grumble. They try to discredit him. And Jesus says it'll be up to the Father who he chooses. So let's see what happens by just reading verses 47 to 58 here. <clears throat> I assure you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. At that, the Jews argued among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, I assure you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, because my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. <clears throat> The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your fathers ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Now, we're not going to go through all these verses in detail, but they're similar in context to 25 through 36. But I do want to go through a couple reasons here that just confirm that Jesus isn't talking about cannibalism. Uh, in Jesus' day, meat wasn't, the, uh, wasn't the, uh, the primary dish. Bread was the primary dish. Meat was the side dish. So when Jesus is saying that he's the bread of life, he's saying he's the most important part of that meal, he's saying he's the most important part of life. And everyone had access to bread. If you were poor, you made your bread from barley. If you were wealthy, you made your bread from wheat. But most everybody had access to bread, one way or another. And effectively, when Jesus is saying this, the analogy is that since bread is available to all of you, I'm available to all of you. 
Remember, too, that eating bread was a means of fellowship back then. In that culture, if you broke bread with someone, you established a relationship with them. And likewise, Jesus is offering that relationship with him, an eternal relationship. Another thing is, is you remember our teaching in Exodus a little bit more than a year ago. Do you remember there was the Holy of Holies and then there was a room in front of that. And in the room before that, there was a table off to the right that had 12 loaves of bread and that was called the showbread. And then there was the menorah on the left that was supposed to be the light of God. But the bread and the menorah both were a symbol for God's presence. Jesus is effectively saying, I have an eternal presence with God the Father all the time. As a sidebar thing, you can remember where Jesus was born. He was born in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. And this is not scriptural, but it is something that is cultural and something that the rabbis talked about. You were never supposed to, you saw bread on the ground. If it fell on the ground, you were never supposed to step on bread. Uh, bread always carried an element of sacredness to it or um, holiness to it. So you cared for bread. If nothing else, look at his claims in verses 47 and 48. I assure you, anyone who believes has eternal life. He doesn't say anybody who eats. He says believes. And then he says, I am the bread of life. So Jesus isn't focusing on eating, he's focusing on believing because he's the bread of life. He doesn't just give life, he is life. And to have eternal life, you've got to have faith in him. And that's a challenge because like the fans, his, his words can disrupt our way of thinking. Um, he forces us to decide what kind of relationship we're going to have with him. That's uncomfortable. I mean, even his disciples say later on in this chapter, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Well, it wasn't that they didn't understand it. They just didn't want to accept it. It's hard. And we can be like this too, can't we? I mean, think about it. Um, Sometimes we think someone just needs a little bit more information about Jesus. Or, you know, if they have that, and then they're going to change their behavior, or maybe they're going to come to faith in Christ. And that might be true. But often, it's not a matter of getting more information. Um, it's deciding who's going to lead your life. Who's going to be your Lord. there are always people that don't want to fully surrender their lives to Christ because they really don't want to quit doing the things they're doing. They're prideful. And like it or not, pride is a barrier to God's grace. Always has been. Always will be. And we struggle with it because we don't like God being in control. So are we upset because of what the bread of life is asking us to do? If we are, that's good. Do we feel like Jesus cramps our style? He does, and that's good too. Does, he seem like, does it seem like his teaching's hard to accept? Yeah, it can be. It's for me. I suspect it probably is for all of you, too, at one time or another. There's things we read and we're going, yeah, but. But the question remains as it did for the Jewish fans. What are you going to do about him? Are you going to walk away because his words are too tough? Or as a believer, are you going to listen to Jesus' words and humble yourself? Are you going to listen to what Jesus has to say and cultivate that relationship with him? Because you're either going to do that, or as it says in Proverbs 3, he's lovingly 
going to humble you. Do you remember what's said in verse 31? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. Just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Do you remember what happened to the manna when the Israelites tried to hoard it? When they became selfish and untrusting, Exodus 16.20 says, it was full of maggots and began to smell. And some of us are putting maggots into our lives today. Our lives may look good on the outside, but our lives have maggots. All of us do. All of us do. So I want to conclude our time this morning with a different kind of meal. One that tastes much better. A meal that's a blessing. The night before Jesus was betrayed, he had supper with his disciples. And he invites us to take part in that same meal until he returns. So as we prepare to celebrate communion now,